This is the fifth and final week of a series that we've been calling The Secrets of Every Happy Family. We said that unhappy families are each unhappy in their own way, but happy families tend to share some common characteristics. And in the course of this series, we've relied on three. We haven't been saying that they're the only three, but they are important ones. So just to recap, happy families accept the natural messiness of family life, they have a mutual respect for each other, and they share a commitment to a larger purpose beyond themselves. We've also focused on the role of fathers, blessing and approving their children, and mothers, preparing their children to go out into the world. So to wrap up our series today, we're going to follow through on last week's message. Now, if you weren't here for that, you can always catch up on that one and any other message by simply visiting our website, sinalfonsis.net, and click on Messages. Today we're going to look at a passage from the book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians. St. Paul, the apostle, established churches in many places in the ancient world. And then after he had moved on, he kept in communication with some of these places through letters. In fact, much of the New Testament is just a collection of those letters. He wrote two letters to the church in Corinth. We call them 1 and 2 Corinthians. Now, Corinth was a wealthy Greek city in the Roman Empire. It was one of the largest cities in the world at the time that St. Paul wrote. The Corinthians were a well-educated community of sophisticated and stylish people. Paul writes to them in part to answer some of their questions about the faith, but in larger part to address the inner conflict of the church there, because the church in Corinth as it turns out, was incredibly dysfunctional. As a community of faith, they had all sorts of problems. There was envy and selfishness and impatience among the members. In fact, members were actually suing each other in Roman courts, arguing over the basis when it came to things like doctrine and practices of faith. And there were darker secrets and sins too. The point is, the Corinthians were far from perfect people. We tend to think of the people in the Bible as being holy or godlike, but it's not always so. While the passage we're looking at is full of great ideas and beautiful language, the people of Corinth were very far from those ideals. The passage we're looking at today is taken from the 13th chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians. And even if you don't know anything about the Bible, you know this verse well, probably because you've heard it at every single wedding you've ever gone to. St. Paul writes this, if I speak in the tongues of human beings and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So St. Paul speaks poetically about the ideal of love. He says, it doesn't matter what gifts or talents or abilities I have. If I'm not motivated by love, they're worthless. He says, it doesn't matter if I can speak well. If I don't speak with love, I'm just making noise. He says, it doesn't matter if I have great wisdom and insight. Without love, it's more like foolishness. And the same is true when it comes to our families. You can live in a great, big, beautiful house right out of Architect's Digest. But if that house is not filled with love, It's not a good place to be. Sure, you can go out to a lavish dinner in a fancy restaurant, but if everyone is fighting with one another, the only thing you're leaving there with is indigestion. You can go to an exotic and expensive vacation, but if you don't bring love along, it doesn't matter how much you spend on that vacation, no one's going to have any fun. You can send your kids to a prestigious and exclusive school. But if there is no love in your relationship with them, then those accomplishments really won't ever satisfy. Without love, our families cannot be happy. 
And we all want happy families. It's, it's what we want. And yet, there's often this gap between what we want and what we have. What we want and what we're experiencing. There can be family dynamics that ought to be in our control, but just seem to be out of control. Sometimes family time can be the most stressful time of the whole week. We can't wait to go back to work or to school just to get away from the circus. Maybe that was your experience this past week. We, we love our families, we do. Everybody loves their families, but often we don't love them as we would like to love them. And the fact of the matter is, that's not your fault. It's not, it's not you, and it's not your fault. Sometimes you just can't love your family the way that you would like to love them because you're not equipped to do so. It's not your fault. We have natural affection for our family members. But affection and proximity, mere closeness, will not be enough to sustain a loving family bond. We need practicals, not poetry. And Paul, as if on cue, switches from some lofty poetic language to some very practical teaching on what love in our family looks like day in and day out. He says, love is patient, love is kind. So now, all of a sudden, we're not up on the clouds with the angels, we're at the dinner table with one another, where patience and kindness come in pretty handy. Patience and kindness cover a wide range of experiences and responses, from suppressing sarcasm to refraining from road rage. Paul is describing lifestyle choice, one in which you bear the fruits and the faults of others as a personal discipline. Now, nobody is naturally like this. Just, just take a look at babies. We're not born this way. It's a choice. It's a personal discipline. St. Paul goes on to say, Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. <laughs> In other words, the perspective of love is always outwardly focused. Love is always about the beloved. Right? Otherwise, it's selfish. Love is about the beloved. Again, we're not naturally like this. It's a lifestyle choice, chosen as a personal discipline. And Paul is just getting started. He continues, it is not irritable or resentful. Now this is a big one, because you and I, we hold on to stuff. You know you do, and you know you won't let it go. Whatever that stuff is, a slight, a wrong, a remark, a criticism, a comment, you hold on to it and you make lists and you carry those lists around you and you're always ready to bring them up as a weapon against the other person. Have you ever been on the receiving end of that? You know, you're talking to someone and all of a sudden they bring up something that happened yesterday or the week before or the year before. And you're left thinking, where's this coming from? But what you didn't know is that this was there all along. They never let go of it. They're brooding over injuries. But Paul says, don't do it. Just don't do it because love isn't like that. Love doesn't do that. And you've got to pray about that. You've got to talk about it with other people, good people, trustworthy and faithful people. And you've got to release it from your heart. Paul concludes, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So love remains steadfast in the face of any and every circumstance. By the way, the repetition of the phrase all things is very significant. Do you know what it meant in the original Greek for the original Greek audience? It meant all things. All things? All things. Everything. Now, if you're thinking, well, that's kind of extreme, 
Well, St. Paul would say, exactly. You understand my point precisely. Love is always trying to protect the integrity of the relationship. Love is always trying to protect the integrity of the relationship. Now that might seem like it's asking a lot. And in one level it is. But at another level, it's actually easier. The alternative behaviors take much more work. It takes so much energy to invest yourself in negative emotions, things like anger or annoyance or impatience. So much energy, unnecessary. But this is where grace comes in. So what is grace? Well, grace is a gift. Grace is unmerited favor. It's a help that comes from God that you cannot earn, you cannot buy, and you do not deserve. But what you can do is you can open yourself up to it. You can position yourself in such a way that you receive that gift. God's grace is a gift, a gift that can transform and change us and bring simple and practical help that we can use in our family life every day. So dispose yourself to that grace so that God can take that affection that you have for your family and apply it practically throughout your family life. See, the thing is, we just can't do it on our own. We just can't. Grace is like the fuel that gives us the ability and the power to do it. And we just need to open ourselves up to receive that. A family is an image and a reflection of God's love. It's an imperfect reflection, that's for sure. But it is a reflection. Its imperfections and our frustration at those imperfections, in fact, point us to a desire for something more. And whether we know it or not, our desire for something more is the family of God. Ultimately, what God is doing in the world is he's building up his family. And the good news is that we get to be a part of it. And we practice. And we learn how to do that really, really well right here in our own families.